Great to see you once again here on our little program. I had some time off. I feel recharged. I hope you guys have all had some time since the World Cup to uh, recharge your batteries as well. It's difficult with all the leagues coming back, plenty in England, uh, Spanish Cup action, Spanish League action, etc., etc. And soon everything will be back. Bundesliga, Champions League, you mentioned it. But that is what we were going to face this year. So I was going to, uh, before I go forward to the Soccer OG podcast, check it out where all podcasts are available. We're going to get a new podcast out later this week with a very special guest, and we'll get back into the rhythm next week. Please like and subscribe our program here. We appreciate all the traffic. Please leave a comment. I love to uh, have conversations with you. And thanks for all the wonderful thoughts that have been made about our World Cup daily show, which really was, uh, I can't believe we did it to be honest, but it was a lot of fun. And I missed the World Cup a little bit. But I knew we had to get back here, and I, I had this misconception that things might get quiet with regards to the U.S. men's national team. I was going to do a video yesterday about the direction of where U.S. soccer is going. And really, we didn't hear much. Now, CBS Sports had Fabrizio Romano, and he is the newsbreaker of newsbreakers. And they asked him about Greg Berhalter, and he's hired by CBS Sports, so he has to stay on top of this. And he said, nothing concrete on the U.S. men's national team coaching search. At moment, it's still open. So at that point, I felt pretty good because I said, I know as much as Fabrizio Romano does. <laughs> no one knows anything. And everyone's getting frustrated with the, uh, the lack of discussion, especially post-World Cup, and the fact that Greg Berhalter's contract expired at the end of 2022. Tab Ramos, who was, with, uh, who was a broadcaster on Telemundo, former U.S. men's great. He was also a big part of many, many developmental groups with U.S. soccer, including the under-20s. He said, I don't hear anything coming from U.S. soccer. Same that happened when Burhalter got hired. No one hears anything, and then something happens. I wanted to hear it from the president or the federation. Well, firstly, I'm glad I didn't record anything yesterday because it would be null and void right now. And we did hear from U.S. Soccer here on this Tuesday. And boy, what a whopper we heard. Nobody expected to hear what we heard. And uh, we are going to get into that. And, I, and look, this honestly is a, a conversation that probably is best had in a couple days' time. We are hearing that U.S. Soccer is going to have um, some sort of... Uh, conference call, and I heard this with uh, Roger Bennett on Men and Blazers, he discussed that on Twitter, and they're going to discuss about who's going to run the January camp. Remember, the U.S. has a couple games coming up in January, a game against Serbia January 25th and January 28th against Colombia on the West Coast. Obviously not super important game, so we don't have to rush in to get a manager here, right? You don't have to rush in. We Remember the time there was between managers before they hired Berhalter and we didn't really quite have that and whatever it is what it is you don't hire a manager just for these two January games I know some of you guys like to call it camp cupcake which is a terrible thing to say because I will promise you something important will happen in that camp on a player or what have you so it's not wasted and I guarantee you anyone who wants to call it that is going to tune in and going to tweet about it and record stuff so we're excited about it I'm excited two good opponents a lot of players that may not have gotten caps might get a run. But let me not get off topic. So they're going to get an interim guy, maybe an assistant, maybe someone along those lines. And that will take us through those games, which are right here. I mean, they're a couple weeks away, three weeks away. And the players will gather even sooner than then. And I'm sure they'll give us some clarity tomorrow about it. Uh, so I probably should wait a day, but I want to talk about it because uh, things are moving very quickly, which is weird because things were going so quiet for so long, but here we are. So we'll get some we'll get some clarity. Again, we're probably not gonna get a ton of it, but we got a lot of it with regards to this situation. A uh, blackmailing, I don't, know if it's, I don't know if it's not extortion, but it's a blackmailing situation with regards to Greg Berhalter that came out of left field. There has been some dysfunction around the US team with players. I think that's pretty normal with most national teams. The Gio Reyna situation obviously sticks out, uh, but the US, uh, I know people will think about it differently. I was happy about their performance in the World Cup. Would love to have seen them score more goals. A lot of teams didn't score a lot of goals. 
and the U.S. lost to a better team uh, in the round of 16. So uh, U.S. soccer, we had two back-to-back tweets or wherever you saw them on whatever social media handle. And it started with the U.S. soccer who said they're doing an ongoing independent investigation, hired a firm to do that. U.S. soccer learned about a potential inappropriate behavior towards multiple members of our staff by individuals outside of our organization. So we're trying to decipher that information, what it means. Or I don't know. Initially, I thought, did, did Greg do something wrong? But then he said, outside of our organization. We'll share results publicly. Uh, and we waited. Didn't have to wait very long. Greg Berhalter, who does have a Twitter account, and we had to wait for U.S. Soccer to confirm that. I mean, he has no following, so he's obviously not using that whatsoever. But he tweeted, during the World Cup, an individual contacted U.S. Soccer saying they had info that would take me down, take me down in quotes. He uh, explained the situation and uh, how he met his wife, now Rosalind, um, and knew that they were going to get married and fell in love. That was back in the fall of 1991, and they have since gotten married and started a family. Uh, 1991, do the math, that's 31 years ago. 31 years. He mentioned one night they went out drinking and he kicked her in the leg. And I don't want to make light out of uh, uh, abuse. It's a very serious situation, and that's part of this. Uh, But that was 31 years ago, and he has made amends with his family and I imagine everyone involved, and he doesn't owe me or you an apology about this, that has been taken care of, including by his wife I feel really bad about because you don't want this to come out, and now we're talking about it, I'm talking about it, I wish we weren't talking about it, but I feel bad for the Burhalter family. This is, I mean, anyone who does this to somebody is the, is the gum on the bottom of your shoe. To say I'm gonna take someone down and not only bring something up, but not that it happened three weeks ago, but it happened 31, 31 years ago. There's a lot of you on here that were not even born yet. 31 years. There is a statute of limitations on these things, especially if things have ended up well and Greg was very apologetic. Again, I was like, I, I, I don't need this from you, but the big picture of things, we have this situation where we wanted a new manager and nobody would have expected this to come out. Uh, We don't know. I thought Brian Sharetta, who's been a guest on my podcast, said it's a good time to let the dust settle. I'm going to try and do that as best as we can. Uh, But this is uh, obviously, you know, a whopper, right? Uh, Some people are saying that this is, by the way, Greg Berhalter, I would give everyone the same advice if something like this happened to get ahead of it get ahead of it. To think that you're going to get away, that you just don't. It's going to come to your doorstep, and it has. And I don't even want to guess as to who did this. And I see some people trying to venture guesses and stop doing that. We don't know. You don't want to even guess what kind of weirdo does this stuff. So um, the review and the investigation, they will announce who will lead this team. Now, people are thinking this is the end for Greg Berhalter. I wouldn't say that yet but they will find an interim person for the January games. Now is, I mean, not the greatest time to really get a new manager. I know some people are antsy. We want a name. We want a name. Well, if you wait, say until the summer, and that seems a long ways away, but if you wait, you kind of get the idea of it, you're going to expand your net of people you can get your wish list. There's some guys that I'm sure they would like that aren't available right now. Not a lot of people are, other than people who are not with their national team or are out of work. You may get someone who at the coaching level. We've heard there's been interest there, so you would like to wait. Uh, Brazil, they're waiting. Brazil. So I don't, that's not a, that's not a situation you rush into just because there is an opening. Now, does that help Greg Berhalter? Because there's an opening and he did a good enough job, I would imagine, in the eyes of U.S. soccer? Probably. We have to look at this a little closer and see if it's the right situation. We're heading into the most important stretch for this sport and you can't have dark clouds looming. Whether Greg Berhalter deserves those dark clouds over them because of this situation, 
Uh, what he did on the field is a different one. I would stand firm and say that, I mean, while I know he's not everyone's favorite and he made some mistakes and his system didn't really quite work, although I think he did do a good job developing young players and I, I think our talent level is not at the place where we all would like to think it is. It's not. We need to improve a lot. But I see that improvement happening. But that said... These next three years are very important, whether it's Greg Berhalter or someone else taking the reins. So while we put a halt on to what's going to happen, we'll get more information about that here very soon. And I would imagine U.S. Soccer is doing their best to protect Greg Berhalter because he still wants to continue coaching. And this is not something that should prevent you uh, from getting jobs. But I know some, some places will veer away from it, including U.S. Soccer. And that's the point I'm going to get to. It would seem that Greg Berhalter's time is, is done, although U.S. Soccer have uh, already pointed out that the decision will not be made based just on this until the investigation takes place. The, uh, the reality is everything has to be close to perfect because this is the moment for American soccer. You need to have the right coach. I, would, I mean, there's a discussion to be had. Do you have an American coach? Do you have a foreign coach? I want to point this out as we get closer to the World Cup of 2026. There's going to be a lot of obligations on this coach because the U.S. are hosting it. And more obligations uh, reaching out to try and build this sport. And immediately, I think an American coach will be better equipped at that. I know they will. But that's a small part of the job, right? It's X's and O's. It's getting the best in developing players. And it's getting results. But that's the starting point. And I know U.S. soccer would want to do everything to get an American coach if they got the right guy. You know, if it's Didier Deschamps, who's a name that has been bounded about there. Yeah, okay, but does he want to go through that process? Probably not. But that's important here. That's important to remember making these appearances and making these connections because you're representing the U.S. national team. You're representing the U.S. hosting uh committee and whatever you want to call it you're representing the united states and north america here when everyone comes to play that's a it's a big job it's bigger than 2022 there's no doubt about it and there's a lot more pressure because there was pressure to advance in 2022 but that pales in comparison to 2026. i think it, it, under these circumstances initially and I, i'd love time to think about this through that it would be hard for U.S. soccer to bring Greg Berhalter back under these circumstances. It just seems almost untenable to go through this and say, we would respectfully, we support Greg and we, we go our different, degree, our different directions. We do know why there was a delay. There were people were getting frustrated, but I think this is U.S. soccer gets vindicated somewhat why they were delaying it. They got, it, they got this information out. They're going to address more of it. Greg Berhalter sent that out as well. Smart. I just... I, I, I just don't see how that can really happen. So we move forward and now we, uh, we wait and see. We should have some more out in 24 hours. I did want to talk really quickly about the U.S. number nine situation. Some good developments. Now, we spent so much time as American soccer fans looking at American players to, uh, uh, in the Dutch league, in the Swiss league, in the German league, in the Turkish league. And we all tweet about it. I do it too. Hey, this is our number nine. They're all doing collectively very well. Haji Wright, Jordan Pifok, although we'll have to see when the German restart, what it looks like there. Uh, Josh Sargent, uh, Daryl DK, who I want to talk about now coming through, putting up big numbers. And this is a position that we know if they find the right guy automatically goes in and starts in 2026. So who is going to be that guy? Well, we don't know. And what we do know, we have a lot of good candidates, but we need a really good candidate to emerge. And I think Daryl DK is that person. I think we said it before, he had the injury concerns. He was already there at Barnsley and playing in the championship. And now he comes back and uh, has looked great since he's been back since mid-November. Uh, they have a new manager since October. Steve Bruce out. Carlos Coberan has come in. And West Brom have skyrocketed up the standings. And he, uh, West Brom, if they get, look, uh, if you look at the championship, EFL, EFL championship standings, 
top two look like they're going to go through already. Three through six. West Brom have a shot at that. I hope, I mean, Middlesbrough have a shot with Zach Steffen. Luton Town have a shot at it. Obviously, Josh Sargent and Norwich, even though they have really hit the skids and they got a new manager. But we hope one of these Americans get promoted in the Premier League organically with their club. And I think DK would be the most exciting of the bunch. He's only started, I think, three games. He has played in eight. He scored a goal against Reading in the midweek, uh, or I mean, earlier this, earlier in the week. Uh, a game winner. He has two goals and assists. He played 66 minutes against Reading. That's the most he's played since he's returned. They broke him back early. It was an incredible goal. I mean, he's six foot two, 200 pounds, and he got he's big. He got low to head it in. He has got all the tools. Everyone's got some good stuff, but this guy has all the tools and is an exciting prospect at a very high level. He's athletic. He is strong. It was like a year ago there was a report about they were judging the strength of these players, and Daryl DK was rated the second of, across all the European players. So that's elite strength. He is smart. He... He does a lot in that area, and now he's getting some flow with West Brom. So while I don't think you just lock him in there, he is already, I know I'm prisoner at the moment, it's what I do, that he has become that number one option uh, moving forward in many ways. Haji Wright scored a, ga a game, a great goal for Anatoly Spore against Fenerbahce, which is great. But Daryl DK, keep an eye on him. Since he's returned, West Brom has won six of their last seven games. Doesn't mean he's not playing all those minutes, but if you return and the team does well, they notice, they notice, I can assure you. Uh, he's rated by transfer market at 7 million. And what I like about Daryl DK is he does also have a connection to the US. He played college ball at Virginia. He played briefly at Orlando City. So a real success story. He seems like a wonderful guy. We're all pulling for him. And it's a great development um, for a, situ a, a defense, a, the two positions, center back and forward, I think are going to be the most interesting. And we're going to spend countless of hours watching games we probably shouldn't to follow these guys. But we hope someone emerges, emerges and I hope it's Daryl DK. I hope it's whomever, but I think it certainly could be Daryl DK. So, never a dull moment with U.S. soccer. Much more. We'll, we'll get back out here with regards to what happened with Greg Berhalter. We'll keep looking at all our players. A lot of action coming in here through the early part of the new year. Like and subscribe. Follow us here, The Soccer OG, and check out our podcast. We'll see you soon. I'll be clean shaven then too.